So when I was 18 months old, I stopped breathing for several minutes. My parents panicked, put me in the back of the car and rushed me to the hospital in the middle of the night, where I was revived and stabilized. Then the doctor thought it was a good time to take my parents aside and give them the bad news. He told them that because my brain had been without oxygen for so long, it had been permanently damaged. He said that the entire side, left side of my body was now paralyzed. He told them that I wouldn't be able to walk again, I wouldn't be able to use my left hand again, and all of these things were going to be permanent. Now, my parents, um, you know, they didn't have much medical training. They didn't actually have much schooling at all because they migrated from Italy uh, after World War II over to Australia. And, you know, my, mom, my mom's from Calabria, my dad's from Sicily, so, you know, <laughs> a bit of trouble. But they don't agree on a lot, but they agreed on one thing. They didn't believe the doctor. So they took me home and uh, they forced me to use the left side of my body. They said, we're going to put the food on your left side. We're going to put your toys on the left side. We're going to tell our, your brothers to play rough with you. And, you know, I don't know if you know this about Italians, but they can be quite stubborn. And uh, <laughs> they got me going. They got me moving. They, and within a few short years, I wasn't just moving a little bit. I was moving a lot. I was running around, climbing things, falling off of things, ending up back in hospital, making my parents really regret that they had given me the motivation to keep going. But... <laughs> The point was that I was, I was fully 100% better. And uh, these days, I work in New York. I am what is called the Director of Rehab Innovation for the Mount Sinai Health System, which is this big health network in New York. And my job is to take new technologies, robotics, virtual reality, mobile apps, anything that you can think of that is just coming out on the market, my job is to take that and apply it to the rehabilitation of people suffering from a brain or spinal cord injury. I really love my job, it's very re rewarding, um, and it's, it's founded on a couple of central questions about how the brain recovers from damage. So we're gonna do a quick crash course on this right now. So our brains are made out of brain cells, we call these neurons, and neurons team up together to produce different functions. So my work and the work of many other scientists have shown that you need a big team of neurons together to produce movement. Now, unfortunately, when you have brain damage, that team is broken. And that is the most catastrophic thing that causes the loss of movement control and all of these symptoms that we see after damage to the brain. Now, it's not all bad news. The brain has the ability to recover, and that ability is called neuroplasticity. What that means is that some neurons that survive the initial damage, they can form new teams. They can reach out to other neurons in the brain nearby that do similar things and pull them into a new team. And sometimes, if the brain gets it just right, that new team can be just as effective as the old team, sometimes even more effective. So it's really exciting that we have this ability to heal ourselves. But a central question in the, in the world of rehabilitation right now is how do we get all neurons to cooperate the way that we just saw our last hero neuron do. You know, not all neurons do that. Sometimes neurons will reach out to their neighbors, other times they won't, and we don't know why. And it's a really important question that we have to solve. The reason for that is that rehab is about to become a global concern. The, the world is aging at an unprecedented rate. It's actually thought that by 2050, there will be three times more people over the age of 65 than ever before. And I don't hate old people or anything like that, you know, <laughs> don't, don't worry. You can trust me around, you're not no and you're not no. But um, the problem is that brain injury increases over time as you age, your risk of brain injury. And so if we don't get some really great th therapies out there that can be very, very effective, we're going to be very overburdened in the time to come. So it's an important question that we need to answer. And so when, when I have these sort of difficult questions, there's an exercise that I like to use, which is it's an innovation exercise. We call it the superhero versus the supervillain. The supervillain is the problem that you're trying to solve. In this case, I'm trying to solve the problem of we have all of these people who have had a brain injury or a spinal cord injury, 
And some of them respond to therapy and others don't, and we don't know why. Some of them will go through hours and hours and thousands of repetitions, and they don't get any better. So that's my supervillain. I need to understand what is going on with these people and how can, we, how can we inspire them to get better. And so then, for my superhero, I look around the world and I try and find someone who's solved that problem already. And so I looked, and I found someone, and I found a superhero. Uh, this is Rebecca Rush. Rebecca is the toughest human being you'll ever meet. She's very resilient. Her competitors call her the queen of pain. That's how tough she is. And she is an ultra-endurance cyclist. She is an elite performance athlete. And as I got to know Rebecca, I started to realize that there are a lot of similarities between someone recovering from a stroke and someone who's training for the Olympics or a world championship or anything that elite athletes are doing. You have these people who need to perform thousands and thousands of boring repetitions of a movement just to get a little bit better but they keep doing it. So I wanted to understand how athletes get such a good record of success while our, our stroke survivors and our kids with cerebral palsy aren't. And so, thanks to the Red Bull Human Performance Division, we got to study Rebecca and a whole bunch of other great athletes. So my colleagues there, Dylan Edwards and Mark Cortez, we got to put wires all over Rebecca and her fellow athletes. We got to follow them around, asking them annoying questions every day. We got to try to see what exactly makes them tick. And we started to see that, yeah, the physical stuff is one thing. They were working really hard, harder than most people that you could imagine. But then there was a whole mental component that we leave out of rehab, where their coaches, everybody, is making sure they're in the right mindset to be doing their exercise every day. So, I started to ask the question, what happens if we start to treat our patients like performance athletes? And at first, I got told, well, this is a silly idea, it's too expensive, it's impractical, patients aren't athletes, you shouldn't do this. But I think I inherited some of the stubbornness from my parents, so I went along and did it anyway. Um, and the first thing I did was I made a video game. This is a video game that was designed to rehabilitate people from stroke. They play a game, it it learns how impaired they are, and it adjusts to just their level of impairment. And then they play, and it makes their rehab fun. So we pulled together a bunch of people who were recovering from a stroke, and we gave them the game to play. And we tightly controlled the dosage of therapy. Everyone got the same amount of therapy. And what we saw after six weeks was that most people improved, but the more fun you were having while you were doing the game, playing the game, the more you improved. What we proved here, which was very, very important and exciting, was that the same dosage of therapy, if it's delivered in a fun environment, it goes further than if it's delivered in an environment that is not fun. So that was exciting, and we thought, okay, maybe there's something here. Um, and then I collaborated with another great scientist who actually lives not too far from here in Brescia. His name's Max Gobo. And a fantastic scientist, and we, we set up a situation where stroke survivors were given two different rehab environments. One environment was lots of fun, and the other environment, yeah, not so much fun. It was pretty repetitive, pretty boring, but they were both aimed at doing the same thing. What we saw was that every single time, in every metric that we were studying in these patients, the more fun environment brought out a harder work ethic. They worked harder, they consumed more oxygen, their muscles pushed harder, everything was harder. So now we're seeing that a fun environment makes your rehab more effective, and it also makes you work harder. So we did one more experiment. We studied a group of patients, a very gr special group of stroke patients, who have a condition called post-stroke apathy. These people can't feel emotions as strongly as you or I. So they're very difficult to engage, and, and they're very difficult to actually get them involved in something that will bring them fun and bring them joy. We studied them alongside people who didn't have apathy, and what we saw was that the people with apathy had much worse outcomes than the people without apathy. So we're really starting to see this idea through all of these studies that fun and engagement is this really important ingredient to successful rehabilitation that people have been discarding. They, they've just been saying, look, make sure they get the rehabilitation. Don't worry if it's fun. Now we're seeing it might be the ingredient that makes it all work. 
And I know that this sounds a little bit like I'm a hippie, and I know, you, you know you've got a lot of people from the West Coast here, and you expect the, the cynical New Yorker to, to not be that way. So let me prove to you I'm not. There's a really great researcher in, um, in Canada called Dale Corbett, and he showed this in rats. So if you put a rodent that is recovering from a stroke on a wheel and it's working away, it recovers. But if you team it up with a community and it's getting a lot of social interaction while it's running on the wheel, it recovers even more. So our brains go into this state when you're being engaged, when you're being challenged, that makes our exercise more effortful and effective. And I'm really fortunate that I get to work with people who are on the cutting edge of all of this stuff. And one of my colleagues, Kathleen Friel, she, she has been inspiring me for years, and she has um, one of the most effective uh, rehabilitation programs in the country for cerebral palsy. And she gets all of these young kids and she treat, treats them like superheroes. It is ab absolutely, literally, superhero training where these kids are playing their games and they're having a lot of fun. They completely forget that they're actually doing rehab and they can't wait to come to the next day of camp and the next day of camp and they get upset when the camp is over. And this is the sort of thing that brings about the best outcomes. <laughs> And, it, and it's really meaningful, you know, when, when you reframe the idea of rehabilitation into play, something magical happens. People forget their limits. Or more importantly, they escape the limits that us as a society have put upon them so that they can now start to do things. They start to realize that internally they have their own strength, that, you know, maybe they don't do things like everybody else, but they do something better. They do it like themselves. It's a little bit different, but it works. They're not defined by their disease or their diagnosis. And this is the message. If we can get this message out, not just to the people recovering, but to their caregivers and to the people in the larger community, this is what is going to take rehabilitation into the 21st century. So I really want to finish up by introducing you guys to someone very special. This is Tom. Tom has severe cerebral palsy. He's nonverbal, which means he uses a computer to speak his words for him. He doesn't walk so well, so he uses a chair to get from place to place. And if you were to sit with Tom, he would be moving uncontrollably the whole time because his brain has a lot of difficulty filtering out unwanted movements. So if you were to see Tom in the street, you probably wouldn't know a lot of things about him. You probably wouldn't know that he has an amazing sense of humor and he swears like a pirate. You also wouldn't know that he has seen more Broadway, Broadway musicals than everyone in this room, probably combined. And you also wouldn't know that he dreams of being an actor one day, and that he was signed recently to appear on a major US TV show as an actor. And not 48 hours ago, I was sitting in New York in a theater that looks like this, and I had the absolute pleasure of watching Tom give a one-man show where in a crowded theater, he performed, he, he wrote, he produced, and then he performed one hour of content to a rapt audience who got up and gave him a standing ovation for his award-winning show. So if that's not a superhero, I don't know what is. And my question is, why on earth would we treat him like anything but that? Thank you.